Well, good morning or good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, The Five Non-Negotiables of a Forward-Looking ERM Program. My name is Jeff Rigsby and I'm the President and CEO of CB Resource and I will be uh, presenting today's session. Uh, first, I do want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Uh, in our invitation, we said the session will run about 45 minutes, and I'm certainly committed to sticking with that time frame. You know, and, and additionally, for those of you who are not familiar with CD Resource, uh, we are based in Irvine, California. We only do three things. We do enterprise risk management, uh, strategic and capital planning, uh, and we serve our bank clients. And just uh, I think we just broke through our 40th state, so we're pretty much in all three time zones. Um, and for those of you who aren't quite sure how we do what we do, is we do fully leverage technology. Uh, we're particularly known for how we aggregate content and presenting effective board and management reporting. And uh, probably what makes us most unique is we don't go away. We, we are uh, a full service solution. So even though you invest in our technology, we stay with you and we're your outsource partner to support your implementation of your ERM program. So if you're a one man or one, one woman shop, it's nice to know we're, we're behind that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And before we get started, just uh, so you can get the most out of this morning or this afternoon's webinar, uh, there is instant messaging. So to the extent you want to uh, post a question in real time while we're going through the presentation, I certainly encourage that and you have that capability to do so. We will have some brief time at the conclusion of the session to also answer any questions you might have and uh, the presentation we'll be using will be uh, available. All you need to do is shoot us a note, give us a call. Uh, you can do it via GoToWebinar. You can uh, send it to Robert Finch, our, our, our Director of Sales and Marketing, uh, or certainly just reach out to us. And I do believe we're also recording the session and it will be available in, in that format as well. You know, it's interesting, I was gonna open up with saying just how new we're going to talk about 2020 insights. So what we're going to cover in our session is, is some insights about this year and what's going on as it relates to ERM. And then we're going to dive in. We're going to talk about the five non-negotiables of an effective ERM program. Uh, we'll talk about the evolution and the types and process, how to implement these non-negotiables and wrap up with some closing thoughts. You know, if I had to define a purpose for, for today's session, I would like to emphasize the fact that ERM is about forward-looking risk management, so I, I, I certainly want to bring that to bear. Uh, ERM is about outputs and decision-making in the end, so I certainly want to stay focused on whatever you do do from an ERM implementation standpoint. It, it should drive good outputs, meaning good information, uh, to enable better decision-making or risk-based and fact-based decision-making. And then lastly, it's just deep processes around what we're calling the five non-negotiables. Now, I think we would all agree as, as we move into some insights or why ERM, uh, if uh, the coronavirus uh, and the oil price war we're now currently facing is not uh, a, a, a red flag of what ERM is all about, I don't know what is. You know, we talk about forward looking and though some might define what we're going through today as, as a black swan event and, and that could be debated. But the point is, it's it's not only about being forward looking, uh, but it's having the framework to respond to a condition. And right now we are all faced with with two material conditions that that may have uh, uh, an impact on our organizations. If you look at, at the coronavirus condition, you may have clients that are in industry sensitive businesses that can affect how they will be conducting their business over the next several months. Um, it could be a community based issue. If you are in an oil sensitive market, be it uh, the Southwest or up through the Dakotas or Oklahoma, you know, oil prices, and if you have clients who are in fracking or service industries, these are all factors, and ERM creates the framework and in, in the lens and in, in the means to capture qualitative and quantitative data and feed that into a system that, that can uh, provide sustainability for our business models in good times and bad. So that really wasn't any prepared comments. It just realized we're, we're faced with, with a condition that ERM can step up and play a meaningful role with, with your bank's management team 
um, in, in terms of capturing useful information, aggregating it, pushing it back out to management, and hopefully supporting better decisions. You know, some general thoughts and insights. You know, in, in, up until today and, and, and historically, you know, we've invested in, in ERM solutions primarily to, to help, you know, improve our control systems and make better decisions to perhaps support a regulatory requirement or, or to, per, you know, a perceived regulatory requirement. Uh, to enhance our institutional decision making, certainly elevating our risk awareness. You know, a, a good reason for adopting ERM and, uh, is, is, if nothing else, it should provide a, an early warning system, right, to, as far as conditions that, that might derail our ability to perform at an optimum level, and certainly to break down any functional silos or, or assure greater business continuity. You know, funny, before these two items I just mentioned, be it the, the coronavirus or the, the the price war in the oil industry, uh, things are, you know, I think elevating the need for a good ERM system as we go into today's discussion. You know, right now when we look at 2020, beyond these two elements that have just hit our just hit our radar screen, is is there's more uncertainty in the market than we've seen for a long time. The interest rate environment, in and of itself, is is creating irrational behavior, uh, potentially. Uh, competitive conflict or, or crisis in that respect. Uh, and we're on in the long end of an economic cycle. So there's a lot of things around us that that kind of ask, ask the bank, you know, do we have the right mechanism in place to effectively assess our environment and respond accordingly from a risk-based perspective? Our business models are more complex today. Uh, our competition is more diverse, more disruptive. Uh, and there's never been a greater need, I think, to connect ERM type of information to support what our executive teams need to have at their disposal and boards to make better decisions. And and so and then <laughs> my last bullet here is answering the question of where is risk going, i.e. emerging risk and threats. And I think we're dealing with that in real time. So just bear in mind, I think the condition now, if you are an ERM champion in your bank, if you've got a system going, it's never been a better time for you to to take on the mantle of supporting the bank's response to certain conditions. If you're considering ERM and, and you have a wary group of board members or management teams that are struggling with why it's a worthy investment, I think the world around us in and of itself makes the argument. So with that said, let's go ahead and talk about first, what are the five non-negotiables? And I do wanna just cut forward for just a second here and, and bring, uh, you know, COSO into it. So if you're not familiar with COSO, COSO really in 2004 developed and, and articulated what they regarded as the framework for an effective enterprise risk management system. And, and they really focused on the fact that it is a process that it, it involves, you know, management and the board of directors in terms of strategy, you know, strategic setting, if you will, designing where you want to go, how you want to get there, and then building a mechanism that ensures you optimize your, you know, what you're doing uh, while controlling your risk. But it was very process oriented. In 2017, they revisited it and they really said, you know, in a nutshell, enterprise risk management includes the culture, capabilities and practices integrated with strategy setting and performance that organizations rely on to manage risk in creating, preserving and realizing value. So when we go back to these five non-negotiables, I really want to set the stage of saying, does your ERM system support your ability to manage risk in creating, preserving, and realizing value? Uh, it's about optimal performance, about sustainability. Uh, and, and we'll talk about the differences of approaches, but I think in the end, the question is, does my ERM system and solution help me manage risk in creating, preserving, and realizing value? Now, in terms of the five non-negotiables to do that, uh, this is our opinion. Right. So we think there's five elements and, and five non-negotiables. The five items are really what is risk appetite, you know, your ability to articulate that. And I'll talk about that in, in a minute. A robust risk assessment platform. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the third element is, is top risk mitigation. Does your ERM system elevate those things that are the most Im high impact risk that your bank faces? And does it identify it? Does it articulate it? Does it help you force rank it and ultimately ensure your controls are appropriate uh, considering it is a top risk? Fourth element of, and non-negotiable is your tracking and reporting systems. 
And then lastly, the manageability. You want an ERM system that serves you. And I can't tell you how many banks I've talked to where it seems it's become they are serving their ERM system. And, and so it, it needs to be manageable, right? So when we talk about risk appetite, risk appetite really does three things, right? It, it can help you quantify and articulate what you're willing to do or not do in key risk categories. It can help you define your key risk indicators, key performance indicators, and understand what your tolerance levels are. And if you fully leverage your, uh, your risk appetite process on the front end, it actually serves as a mechanism to calibrate your risk assessment system. If you're currently got an, an ERM system that deals with risk appetite as you're in the midst of making sausage, it's not that that's not useful, it's not optimal. It's not on the front end of the process. Number two is from a risk assessment standpoint, most ERM risk assessment systems are assessment systems, right? They're evaluating inherent risk, adequacy of risk management, residual or composite or aggregate risk, direction of risk. But the question is, is how does it, how does it view both qualitative and quantitative data? And how does the data aggregate and report? You know, it's, it's fine to have a lot of data points and test controls and things of that nature. But, but how does the system generate useful information and outputs as a risk assessment system? And then taking us to that third non-negotiable, how does that risk assessment platform percolate top risk to the surface? Does it, can you look at your, your outputs today and say, oh my goodness, that, that seems to be a risk of a greater magnitude? And, and then ask the question of, well, what is, the likelihood of that occurring? What is the severity of that occurring? If it does occur, what's the consequence? Where does it reside? What do my current controls look like? And if they're adequate, great. But if my residual risk is too high, does this serve as the mechanism to percolate mitigating uh, components that bring that risk into control? So that's kind of the third pillar, if you will. Fourth, tracking and reporting certainly needs to be, you know, routine mechanism needs to be in place. But we'll get into this more, but tracking and reporting has to be all about who gets what and when, right? If, if tracking and reporting is about articulating information in a way that can form, you know, better control systems, better responses, and ultimately optimizing performance while controlling risk, you know, tracking and reporting is key. And then manageability just comes down to how do we integrate technology, subject matter expertise, and efficiencies to, to serve the purpose. And uh, so those are kind of the, the flyover levels of what we believe the five non-negotiables are. I would like to talk a little bit about how each one of those, what each one of those steps can look like for you and for your organization. Um, you know, we talked about COSO. So, you know, COSO really is the design work that says, hey, this is how ERM should work. And, and as I said earlier, I think when, when COSO first rolled ERM out, it reminded me somewhat of Malcolm Baldrige, right? And it was we do want to be great companies and we want systems to help us be great, but we get so all consumed with the process, maybe we lose sight of the purpose. And, and then in 2017, they kind of came back to it and said, oh, I get it. You know, the purpose is, you know, creating, preserving and realizing value. You know, it's funny, I joke about what my role is with our clients and our, our role is, is to help our clients make as much sustainable income and create as much value as possible while ensuring any level of risk is appropriately controlled for the level of risk they're taking. But it is about performance optimization. You know, ERM is not about, you know, re it's not about risk avoidance, right? It's not about avoiding risk. It's about mitigating and controlling risk. And, and that's how I like to think about it. You know, there are a couple of approaches to ERM. Some of you that are already doing enterprise risk, you may have a top-down approach. You may have a bottoms-up approach. If you're a real fan of bottoms-up, we may not be covering that much today. So if you need, if you have something else to do this morning, uh, you know, the system I'm, I'm talking about really probably lends itself more to a top-down philosophy. Uh, but bottoms-up is very good. They're both good, right? A bottoms-up approach tends to drive robust risk management across the enterprise and allows for maybe the, the greatest number of participants but it really gets down at that granular level, right? And it's about the controls you have in each individual, be it, you know, policy process, procedure, and testing it almost from an auditing standpoint. I almost look at it bottoms up as kind of a, 
a GRC approach, right? Government risk compliance methodology. When you look at top down, this is really about enabling management to make better risk based decisions in dealing with risks that that could could really inhibit your ability to perform. So top down, you know, it tends to look at things on a a, a more strategic perspective, although it, it gets into the nitty gritty, but it does tend to clarify what the top risks of the bank are. Uh, it definitely facilitates the ability for a CRO to engage in a very in, uh, robust dialogue with the board management because it touches on the key factors that, that relate to performance. Albeit you could be talking about granular elements within compliance and operational risk, but, but a top-down system tends to bring it back to the surface, right? It tends to bring it to, so what do the big decision aid makers need to know? Uh, but if you can find the nexus, right? The middle is good, robust feedback, bottoms up, uh, but, but somehow articulating that data in a top-down approach so that you can answer that question when management looks at your report and asks the question, uh, so what, right? So, but there are two types. When you think about it from a process standpoint, you know, to use a regulatory perspective, most regulators, to the extent they know what they might know about ERM, they're going to ask you a pretty simple question. Tell me how this system identifies, measures, monitors, and controls risk, because that's what ERM is supposed to do, right? How do I identify, measure, and monitor and control my risk? That, that are the, those are the four pillars of ERM, regardless of the process, right? Regardless of top-down, bottom-up, it better do these four things. When we talk about a top-down approach, just add that, third, that, that initial column in green there, which, which basically says, I actually, before I engage in my ERM methodology and approach, I need to kind of have my governance in order. I need to know what my strategic intent is. I need to know where my bank wants to go and how it wants to get there because that'll allow me or provide me the data to really develop a very articulate risk appetite. And in our world, we think that needs to be done by risk category, not just an overarching risk appetite statement, but what's your risk appetite within each key risk category, develop the statements to define it, start working on those KRIs. And, and so that's kind of what you do at the tip of the spear. That's what a top-down approach would do. And then you roll in to identify, measure, monitor, and control risk. In our world, identifying risk is all about a robust enterprise risk assessment that talks about inherent risk, adequacy of risk management, residual and direction. It can look at key risk categories like the standard you know, risk categories like credit and interest rate risk, liquidity, price, operational risk, strategic risk, reputation risk. But it also gets into the other stuff, right? Cyber risk. If you're dealing with fintechs now and you have a payments platform, well, there better be a module for that. If you have trust, if you have wealth management, if you're in the mortgage business, uh, Whatever those additional business lines might do, then there needs to be a module within your enterprise risk assessment platform that addresses those. That gets that identification and, and first cut of data available. The, that next measurement piece is, well, hey, what, how do I analyze this data so I can determine where the greater risk resides and, and really look at the likelihood and severity of that risk, where it resides, how we're doing in controlling that risk. If the residual risk is not acceptable, what are the mitigating issue or the what mitig mitigants are we going to nominate to build into a risk mitigation plan? And that kind of feeds the monster. So if you think of those three elements, that kind of gets your implementation in order. Monitoring is answering that question, who gets what and when, and that's distribution, that's frequency, that's nature of design of what a decision maker needs to see from an ERM system to make good decisions. And lastly, controlling it is just that, right? How do we take this information? And, and work in real time to make sure we're calibrating our behaviors and activities to drive optimal performance, but maintain our risk controls, right? That's what it's all about. And it's an infinite loop, right? We continue to get better at this over time. So let, let's go ahead and take the balance of our time and just break down each one of these components and what they might look like and, and how we might approach it, right? So, and, and I apologize if, if, you, if many of you have done this before, uh, awesome. That's great. And by the way, I, I do think in the end, ERM, if you really want to be successful, it needs to be boiled down to be non-complex. So the more you can simplify the outputs and allow them to stand on their merit, the more useful the data. So let's talk about risk appetite a little bit. And, and just so we have agreement what risk appetite is, it, it is the level of risk your bank's willing and prepared to accept to achieve your financial goals, 
right? Whatever, whatever you're targeting to do, your risk appetite kind of says, well, you know, this is what I'm willing to do or not do to make money when you get right down to it, to create value. Uh, and, and in our world, we tend to look at it at a five, five point scale from low, low, moderate, 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 high, high. And then your key risk categories. This is just a sample, right? This has kind of the basic uh, components you'd consider like credit risk, interest rate risk, liquidity risk. But it's really important to adopt a methodology that looks at risk in a common lens. So whomever your audience is, be it your management team, your regulators, whomever, it, it's understandable, right? When we're talking about credit risk and what we're willing to do, uh, that's pretty clear as you start talking about your risk appetite. So this is kind of the framework, right? We'll talk about it and you can be low to high. And, and the, the higher your risk appetite gets, meaning the more you're willing to do to create value, uh, then the more robust your enterprise risk management system needs to be, right? So if you think about it and kind of what I'm saying here, it serves as a blueprint to calibrate your risk assessment system. If you have a bunch of appetite items out in this range, you really want to make sure you have a robust system that can you know, effectively track, monitor, and control the risks associated with that higher risk appetite is. Real quickly, what what should come out of any risk appetite exercise? Number one is that heat map. What what are you willing to do or not do to 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 create value, right? To to optimize your performance. So you get the heat map. You need to have risk appetite statements. Those statements basically tell anybody that's looking at your risk appetite, what you mean by low or low, moderate, 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 high or high. So you need those articulate risk appetite statements. Uh, you can certainly do a risk appetite statement that's a broad uh, approach to what your risk appetite is bank wide, but we believe there needs to be a risk appetite statement by risk category so we more fully understand what risk we're willing to take. And then that third component or output should be that work that you're doing around your key, your key risk indicators or key performance indicators. It should be able to define it by area and then establish what your tolerance levels are across the spectrum from low to high, right? So these are the three outputs. These are the non-negotiables. If you're working on your risk appetite, if you're not spitting these three things out, there, there's something missing, okay? And remember when you're talking about risk appetite, and, and sometimes I, I think people talk to me about risk appetite and they think I'm confusing it with inherent risk uh, because inherent risk is obviously the higher, you know, you could be talking about higher risk. But when you're thinking about risk appetite, it really gets broken down into some key factors. What's your appetite for growth, right? If you're growing at above average rate, do you believe you're taking above average risk? You need to think about that. If you're doing organic growth and you're doing acquisitions, if you're an acquiring bank, does that elevate your risk appetite? If you have a complex model, if you have complex products, if you're creating a digital bank as a channel, if you have brokers, if you have wholesale, if you have bankers, if you have branch systems, you also have online, you have mobile, you have different types of products that serve different types of customers. What is the complexity? These are factors that are non-negotiable elements that need to filter into your discussion around your risk appetite. Your multiple, your delivery channels and your systems. Now, asset quality is, is kind of a moving needle, but when you think about it in banking, it, more times than not, it's all about asset quality, right? And, and when we talk about concentrations, concentrations can exist in a lot of places. Uh, most popular and most aware, we're kind of, we talk about commercial real estate concentrations, but you can have geographic concentrations, you can have customer concentrations, uh, on the deposit side or liability side of your balance sheet, you can have concentrations with key deposit relationships. The more you do that kind of stuff, guys, you're elevating your risk appetite. And it's okay. You just need to acknowledge it. So you're putting an ERM and a control system in place that that is effective, right? And when you move from developing that heat map to defining it, you want to do a couple of things, right? You want to describe and explain if your risk appetite is X, Tell me why. That should be the first purpose of the statement. And then we think it's effective also to summarize your control systems. And this is a simple one where somebody wrote about their operational risk appetite and they decided to sit on the fence a little bit. And they said, our operational risk appetite is moderate to moderate high. When considering our desire to adopt technology solutions that enhance our client experience and improve efficiencies. So boom, they're talking about their investment in technology. We also are exposed to increased level of risk associated with ACH and wire transactions, both volume and size. 
and we're big on that. We have big customers, a lot of uh, transactions. We have a payment platform. Boom, that's driving our risk. We know we're doing that. We know it takes on more risk. And hey, we have a growing dependence on third party providers or, or partners. Those factors indicate this is why our risk is X, right? And then the following statements really summarize some of the key elements that either there's lower risk or, or our controls. But th this is the construct that we believe is important when you build any risk appetite statement. And lastly, just, you know, in determining what your key risk or key performance indicators are, just basically having a format. And if you guys are, those of you that are participating, if you want to, you know, a, a boilerplate version of this, I'm sure you can bug Robert, he can get it to you. But but it's really about articulating what are those KRIs. We really emphasize looking for the vital few. And then being able to articulate what those ranges are effectively to determine what your tolerance levels are and how it ties back to your risk appetite, right? So, and, and it, it's really important to, to take a look and say, can I tie benchmarks into this? You know, where does this data come from and how often is it available? But, but that's kind of the, the KRI standpoint. And just a closing thought again about your risk appetite. If you find you have risk, you, you have a, a greater appetite for risk that falls into certain areas, understand that that's an indication of what your ERM system needs to make sure it's measuring appropriately. If you're low, low, moderate on everything, great. You know, the pretty standard fare, the process is the process. But if you have elevated risk, I have clients that live, you know, regional SBA chefs that live with 800% CRE concentrations. You know, they need a special system in their ERM system to recognize that concentration level. I have clients that have 13,000 merchants on their ISO platform providing payment solutions, running five to $10 billion through their bank a month. Does, is their ERM system addressing that? When you articulate in your risk appetite what level of risk you're willing to take, it allows you to more effectively calibrate your enterprise risk assessment system. And I really want to leave you with that thought. When we get to the assessment, and I am sensitive to time, I want to keep this going, think of your assist, assessment framework in both qualitative and quantitative terms, right? So if you're using an Excel model, you know, so be it. If you've got a web-based tool, if you've got a, a service provider, but you want to start it at the 30,000 foot level, but you want a framework that says, hey, what's my risk appetite? I've, I've qualitatively determined what that is. What's, what's the aggregate roll up of my inherent risk, my adequacy of risk management, my composite and direction? Can I look at it 30,000 30, foot level and look at the qualitative responses? But wouldn't it be nice as well to have something that immediately shows you the quantitative that ties back to your KRIs? And you can see in this example, it's like, what are my you know, my credit risk key risk indicators and be able to, on this home page, be able to go from credit risk indicators to interest rate risk indicators, liquidity, price, operations, compliance, things of that nature. But you really want to be able to integrate both the qualitative, what's the feedback from my system and the quantitative. How do I validate through hard data, be it external or internal, right? And then how do I drill down? So if I'm talking about compliance risk at this level, does my system drill down further so I can drill down and say, well, how does my compliance management system look? BSA, you know, fair lending, composite. But does your mechanism, the framework of your assessment system, allow you to look at it, you know, from the 30,000 foot level to the 10,000 foot level, really looking at that inherent risk, adequacy of risk management, composite or residual risk and direction, and ultimately drill it right on down to that that bare line item. Some people, I've seen systems call line item detail in a risk assessment system as a KRI. That confuses me. I'm sorry. To me, it's a risk attribute. It's a component of what makes up risk. KRIs are the high level stuff. But one way or the other, you do want to be able to drill down to that lowest level, respond to what you believe your inherent risk to be, what your adequacy of controls are, and on a single screen, be able to see what, what the movement has been over time, right? Then lastly is focus on the content. Make sure your library of what you're assessing is useful. You know, so establishing the right content is what your risk assessment is all about. This happened, if you guys want to copy this, we can get this to you. This is a checklist of the minimum components that should go into any risk assessment. There's a lot more that should go into it, but, but this is kind of an inventory list that says, well, minimally from a credit risk, interest rate risk, liquidity risk standpoint, these are the things I better be measuring, right? And I better have answers for. Um, and then lastly, what I what I find so often that I'm not seeing in enterprise risk management systems 
is the external data that supports the forward-looking. We started this, this session talking about a forward-looking system. And forward-looking is, is, hey, what the heck is going out there, out there one, two, and three years ahead? So you want to make sure that through your ERM platform, your, your discipline, you're looking at, at things like your uh, five-year forecast on national, state, and local economic trends. That's ERM's job, right, to report that back. What's going on in our markets? Can we look forward and look at the demographic movement? Are our markets flat? Are they actually shrinking? Are they growing? And, and what's that do to optimizing our performance and sustainability? And how do I tie that information back to my ERM system? And then can I even look at what's going on in the industry? So I can kind of get a feel for, for movement in terms of growth trends and earnings trends, asset quality trends. But, you know, to really serve a, a comprehensive ERM system, it's not just about the assessment platform. It's about the external analysis provided through other means that can help make better decisions and tie that back to your platform. And then kind of lastly on the assessment process, you know, this is kind of a weird visual, but just think about it. Whether you're looking at the 30,000 foot level roll up or you want to drill down to the line item detail, but if, if you want to force rank and track, where's my greatest inherent risk reside? Where are my weaknesses in my controls? Uh, where are the risks that are trending more rapidly forward? Well, your system needs to move from macro to micro, be it on a web-based tool, an Excel-based tool, whatever form you're using, uh, but you really want to be able to, to draw that data in and provide good analysis and also comparative analysis uh, to the extent you've got that available. But it's the ability to move up and down through the data to support better decision making. So that's kind of the, the number two. So number three, we talked about top risk. If your risk assessment system is doing its job, somewhere in there, if you're, if you're conducting a risk assessment, let's just use a broad category like credit risk, then you know, you've, you've talked about your inherent risk and adequacy risk management and in both your, your in residual risk and direction. But does your process allow you to talk about and articulate and capture those controls that, that control that level of risk? But more importantly, is your system asking you what emerging risk and threats are coming up? What's, what's going on out there? And, and does it capture it in some form or fashion? Because in the end, and this is somewhat of a qualitative exercise, it could be an automated question and answer system, but the qualitative question is, hey, where is risk going? In credit risk, hey, we're on the long end of an, an economic cycle in a favorable credit cycle. Is this corner about to turn? Does my assessment capture that? And if it's about to turn, where is it kind of turning? You know, are, are we overbuilding in the markets we're in? Are we likely to have excess capacity on the commercial real estate side? Is, are we are we going to start seeing movement in the hospitality industry? But but the question is is can we identify some of those top emerging risk or threats and and kind of force rank them? Find out where do they reside and is there a subcategory they reside? Define them to me. You know, if it's cyber risk and you're worried about a breach of, of non-public information, so be it, right? If, if you're looking at just a pure volume of what you're doing vis-a-vis -vis online banking, if you're doing an acquisition a year, if you're converting to a new system, um, on and on and on, whatever those top risks are, have a vehicle that you can capture them and then force rank them and actually determine what their impact is. Once that's done, you can define it, right? And then you can ask the question, what's the likelihood of that occurring? And if it were to occur, how severe would it be? And if it's really severe, where does that severity reside within the risk categories of my bank? It may not reside much here, but it may reside a lot in here. And what's that do to my overall inherent risk of this specific threat or emerging risk? How do my current controls look? How do I grade my current controls? If my residual risk is not satisfactory, what mitigating factors am I nominating to better control that risk, right? Pretty simple stuff, but most systems don't necessarily capture an arbitrary specific threat and facilitate the discussion. And I'm telling you that a, a, a non-negotiable for ERM today, I think, should be tell me what that threat is so that I can assess that specifically. It's not some boilerplate threat that's in every risk assessment. It may be unique to you. What if it's a succession issue? 
right? What if you just signed up and, and you decided to do cannabis banking? You know, what strain or or or, or whatever, you're, you're going to become a, a cryptocurrency platform. And these are all funny because these decisions are being made. They are happening right now. But if you're dealing with risks that are elevated or greater than the average kind of risk, have a system that at least can test your controls associated with that specific emerging risk or threat. Right. And then if it effectively nominates for their controls, first of all, you can go through the process and you can say, wow, our controls are fine. Question asked and answered. If you do end up nominating additional things that, that need to be done, then capture them so we can you know, number that top risk, describe it, establish who owns that risk, and then develop an action plan, right, to conduct and monitor the mitigation of that top risk. And this all feeds into a good reporting system, right? So if you think about what we've just gone through, we, we said, what's our risk appetite? What are we willing to do or not do to make money, to create value uh, for our primary stakeholders? How do we assess the risk that we faced across the enterprise? Is it robust? Does it give us good data? Does it elevate top risk in our organization so we can analyze those and, and make sure we have the appropriate controls in place? So we've done that now. So as we move into it, and we're talking about tracking and reporting, before you start diving into something or looking at a boilerplate turnkey reporting package, it, it comes down to who gets what and when. Because I'm gonna tell you, your board doesn't want to look at, and, and I know we've got a lot of CROs on this on this call. Let's face it, your board doesn't want to see all your data, right? It's it just it, they're they're going to look at you and they're going to start glazing over, and that's important data to a lot of important people, but it may not be to them. So the first thing you want to make sure your ERM system allows you to do is create and calibrate information that makes sense to the key decision makers at every level. So what a board member looks at is going to be different than your senior team or your management team or your committee members, right? So the first thing I just want to stress up front, take the time to, to manage your content. Because I said it when we started. One of the takeaways I want you to think about and as a non-negotiable is if your outputs aren't any good and you're really impressed with the technology and, and all the cool stuff your system is doing, if the outputs aren't compelling, uh, to key decision makers, I'm not quite sure why you're doing it all, right? It, it's got to ultimately be compelling. It ultimately has to drive decisions. And if you ever get that that look on somebody's face that says, and, and so what, then we haven't quite got, it doesn't mean the data is not in your system. It means we haven't quite re designed the reports quite right yet. So consider your, your audience, right? Board members, top risk, emerging risk, KRI trends. What's the current market outlook? How's it impact performance? That it, it needs to be brief, concise. You know, management a little broader, right? Talk to me about what you told the board, but what what are we doing in each of these risk areas? What what's going on from a mitigating standpoint? Is there something we could be doing to better support performance or better control a risk? And then lastly, at the committee level, you guys own it all, right? So how do you catalog it? How do you capture it? How do you manage your mitigation plan? But just think about the first step of good re tracking and reporting is all about who gets what and when. And then it's all about actionable intelligence, right? It, it comes down to, so how do I take all this good data I'm collecting and, and you know, data needs to morph into information, right? It, just data isn't good enough. Data needs to be information and information needs to be actionable. So whether you're looking at board level and you want to just articulate, hey, this is our risk appetite, no, by the way, Here's our risk profile. And the reason I'm putting our risk profile, which tells us what our control systems look like, is if our control systems aren't adequate for the level of risk we're taking, even at the 30,000 foot level, maybe we better, you know, re retest or make sure we're, we're, we're right there. So think about how your outputs are creating in, information that's useful to the user. And, and it should be actionable, right? So, and these are just examples, right? This is kind of board level stuff. This is a report that basically gives a capital impact, literally capital adequacy on a quarterly basis based on your risk profile. You know, what do the regulators expect? What do you expect? And where are you? And how frequently do you get to look at that? What's the aggregate roll up of all of my risk assessments? These could be web-based dashboards. They could be standalone reports, but they should be designed with an actionable output, right? 
So if we're looking at financial exceptions and credit like this line right now, and somebody said, hey, we've been doing a lot of exceptions, but hey, you know, we think the economy's getting a little iffy. We think we need to tighten up a little bit. Well, my goodness, we do want to see in that next quarter, we want to see those exceptions trend down. If they're still showing red over time and we made a decision to tighten and we're not seeing it, then, you know, that's what that's that's what the the trend analysis and the forward looking aspect of VRM is all about. OK, so really design information in, a, in an actionable fashion, you know, and so just lastly, this manageability thing. All I can ask you up front, if you have not invested in ERM or if, even if you got one, step back for a second and revisit kind of the scope of your system, because really your business model, the size of your bank, the complexity of the bank, the, your risk profile and risk appetite really should influence both your budget and, and the, mech, the, the platform you choose to invest in, right? And, and, and I don't want to suggest if you have a lower risk profile, but you want good disciplines, then there's some basic systems. But if you think about our industry, going back to how we started today, whether we're thinking about coronaviruses or, or, or fuel wars or, or just all the other emerging risk and threats that are occurring in our business, the level of complexity that's coming with, with the entering of, of fintech companies and, and emerging disruptive competitors, all these factors does influence your ERM decision. So I guess what I'm saying from a manageability standpoint, make sure you're, you're investing in something that reflects the nature of risk you want to manage. And then it's, it's, it's balancing technology, subject matter expertise, and efficiency. So technology, yeah, automation is awesome. It, it, the more you can automate, it, it can make the process more efficient. It can expand the level of participation. Uh, I caution whenever you invest in a technology platform, I, I, I've seen so many situations where it's this, this coolest, slickest technology, but all of a sudden you have to make decisions around catalogs of information. And so the technology may be awesome, but all of a sudden the subject matter expertise on your side may or may not be up to the task of calibrating the system. So when you look at that technology decision, also ask yourself, is the content readily available and is it, is it tied back to how the, the technology is going to work? Um, and, and the technology should be part of, of your, your, your report engine and your outputs, right? If it's real labor intensive to manage, if you think about um, do you want to manage the system or do you want the system managing you? I don't know what most of your staffs look like. I don't know what you're trying to manage. Uh, but uh, but we can overinvest in technology and we never get to the true purpose of ERM. So I always look at striking the right balance with technology. Uh, subject matter and in, in expertise, whether it's in-house or outsourced, the, the, you just need to have good information, right? Subject matter expertise is how do I use this stuff? How do I report it? How do I make a difference to my bank based on this system? So technology is not the answer without smart content and smart abilities. So, so that, that might sound like a, a daunting task, uh, but it is important. And lastly, kind of efficiency, it's kind of funny because if you think about it, you definitely want your system to scale and technology certainly plays the role. But think about this, the better your system is in terms of creating outputs that make a difference to people, my rhetorical question is, if your senior leaders and risk owners really embrace the system because it's useful, doesn't that give you more resource and make you more efficient? So when you're looking at your investment in your systems and when you're looking at your platform and you're talking about fighting with management every time you want them to go through something, spend the time to determine how you engage them in some form or fashion. I guarantee you with that engagement comes more efficiency because you have more resources to bear. Okay. So with that, summing it all up, these, these are the five things that, that I think are the non-negotiables for good ERM. And, you know, just think about it, a robust system up front that really captures your risk appetite and articulates it in a way, be it a, a heat map, but with statements that, that explain it and with KRIs and KPIs that help you monitor your tolerance levels over time, month over month, quarter over quarter, whatever your cycle is, but that front end piece. The next one is, is a platform or a risk assessment system that can aggregate at the highest level because everybody kind of wants these. So in the end, 
what's my compliance risk really look like, but also be able to drill down to high, you know, to a, a granular level of detail, uh, easy to capture the information, and most importantly, not just about qualitative information. It's, your risk assessment system really needs to tie in quantitative analysis from whatever system it may be. So if you're thinking of operations or IT, those are transaction oriented. If you're thinking about compliance, it's not as easy as the financial side of the house, but you still need those qualitative measures. Okay, or I'm sorry, quantitative. Third, third non-negotiable, top risk mitigation, mitigation, whatever adoption, whatever system you adopt, make sure it really percolates to what, what risks have the, the, the most impact on your bank and are they adequately controlled and are they adequately being mitigated? And then do your tracking and reporting systems, are they robust? Are they designed with users in mind? Uh, how timely and accurate are they? And in the end, does your tracking and reporting support better decision making? So keep asking yourself, it's like, hey, did a decision come out of this from after presenting this data? And lastly, find that happy medium of, of leveraging technology, ensuring you've got the right subject matter expertise, and always try to make sure that the system is serving you and you're not serving it. Um, so those are my five non-negotiables. My closing thoughts, you know, ERM goes way beyond regulatory compliance. It, it really is all about optimizing value while controlling your risk in good times and bad. Uh, 2020 and, and beyond require, I think, a system that synchronizes risk management and performance management priorities. Uh, a system without forward-looking intelligence doesn't, doesn't provide that early warning systems we need or have the framework that we need to deal with what we're, we're confronting right now. And then 2020 ERM, really, it's, it's, it should just, in the end, ask yourself the question, do you does your system help create and preserve and realize value? So that's kind of the bulk of, of the my program or, or my overview of what I think are non-negotiable items for ERM. Um, before we jump to questions and answers, I do want to say a little bit about us, just, just to throw it out there one more time. Just, you know, when you think about what we do and, and it all comes back to we're definitely heavily committed into ERM, we ensure that our community banks clients business uh, and risk priorities are in sync, and we do accomplish it by integrating, you know, strategy, ERM, and capital planning. Uh, but what's really important, what I want to leave you with about us, and we'll get to Q and A, is we're the only ERM solution pro provider I know that we do have really good technology, and but in the end, we're high touch, and and we are your back office. If you're a small support group, and you need a provider that just needs to be there after you buy the software. That's us. We're the guys that are with you to make sure the implementation process works, that the tracking and reporting are robust and continue to improve. So our clients after the sale is just the beginning of our journey, not the end. And I just want to say that about us. So with that, we have a bunch of solutions. I hope you'll look into them and work with Robert to talk to him. But in the end, any questions on, on ERM or the five Intolerables. I'm looking at my screen. Oh, um, what's a typical time to if you're if, what's a typical time to implement an ERM program? Um, great question. I mean, it's it, it varies for different banks. If you if you think about what we just discussed, so when I think of an ERM process, the first thing I'm going to do is is look at my policies and governance. So I'm going to say, hey, do I have a charter? Do I have do I have a policy? Do I have charters? That's step one. And then step two is, okay, I, I, what's my strategic intent? I want to develop my risk appetite. So step two, risk appetite, heat map, statements, KRIs. Uh, step three, now that I know what my risk appetite is, I want to conduct my enterprise risk assessment. So I'm going to go through my entire organization, get all my risk owners together, and we're going to go through a series of enterprise risk assessments to create that baseline assessment. So that's step three. Step four is I want to see if those top risks percolate. And if they do, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll have this as a visual. So step one, step two, step three, top risk. Got my tracking and reporting up, and now I'm generating monthly, quarterly reports, whatever they need to be for all my stakeholders. If you're in a real hurry, and I'm speaking from our experience, you know, standing up an ERM system start to finish could be done in as quickly as two weeks. 
I think that would drive most companies insane. We have done it in that period of time. It's usually for a reason. Uh, typically, though, a, a few months. You know, think about that you need involvement to do the process. So, you know, a couple of weeks to get risk appetite done, a couple of two to four weeks to get the risk assessment done, another couple. And I'm not talking about it takes that amount of time. It's just you're busy banks, right? So it's you got to herd the cats. It's probably 40 man hours altogether to do an implementation when you when you try to measure a bunch of stuff. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, but if your management team's committed, you're ready to go, it could be done relatively quickly. But if I had to say on average, two to three months. And uh, okay, I don't see any other questions. So with that, I am going to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Uh, I'm putting Robert's information up on screen. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, uh, by all means, please let us know. Uh, I really encourage you to contact us if, if you already have an existing ERM system and you want us to just look at what you're doing and give you an opinion, we're happy to do that. I will say we have a bias, but we also recognize banks make commitments to systems and we can help you in any scenario optimize what you have. But if you'd also like to learn more and really peel back the onion of what our solutions look like and how we integrate strategy and capital to make this fully comprehensive, um, seamless you know, system work, we really encourage you to contact Robert or me directly and we'd love to spend some time with you and, and help you understand how we help our clients. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you all. Uh, oops, you know what, I'm sorry, there is, I missed one of the questions. Oops, I didn't realize this was, how does one gather data to do the forward-looking intelligence? I'm sorry, I've got a few more, so I hope some of you are still with us. Uh, <laughs> I apologize, guys, this, it was scrolled up. How does one gather the data to do the forward-looking intelligence? Okay, um, it, it, short answer, subscription services. So I'll tell you what we, what we do is we have the subscriptions, but when you're looking at gathering forward-looking data, there's obviously multiple agencies that you can tap into. In our world, in, in what our customers get from us, is we use Moody's Analytics. So I, we have a master license agreement with Moody's. So for all that national, state, and local economic analysis that our clients need, we pull off the off the, the Moody's system and it's dropped into ours. You can go right to Moody's. Uh, that's one source for economic data. There's others, right? You, in, uh, you can look at, at various universities that do that locally, but that gives you kind of your economic data. For psychodemographic stuff, uh, ESRI or ESRI is very effective, and and you can give them your target market data. That's another subscription service, but that's also one that comes with our package. But many of you probably are familiar with ESRI, which gives you all the psychodemographic movement of your markets, which is invaluable in anticipating if your markets are growth markets, shrinking markets, or static markets, and because that really helps, and you can see the relationship with strategy, uh, but but that's another form. Uh, industry intelligence is readily available. For those of you, and a lot of our clients are heavy in, in commercial real estate activity, uh, and, and uh, we can get you a list of uh, CRE, but you kind of look at your local market, look at your national market, look at your trade organizations, by the way, and, and we have a lot of clients in Texas, Texas Bankers Association is one of the best providers of data forward-looking wise. So leverage your regulators, uh, look at things like the OCC's uh, semi-annual risk perspective. I can give you a ton of these. I hope this gives you a little bit of insight, Tim, but, uh, but it's hard to gather it all. It's a job in and of itself. Um, but great silos. So, so what do I need to know economically? What do I need to know from a psychodemographic standpoint? What do I need to know from a product perspective, from an IT or technology perspective, uh, from a regulatory perspective, and uh, start creating an inventory list? That's how we typically do it. Uh, I'll, I'll make a sales pitch here. We do most of that for our clients, but uh, but you can do it on your own, and those are some some examples of how you can do it. Uh, next question, how should ERM drive the risk-based internal audit scope? Uh, great question. So how should ERM drive the risk-based internal audit scope? Well, 
Great question. And when I think of audit scope, I think of a bank's audit universe, and I think of uh, determining where risk resides. I'm not quite sure if ERM drives it or if ERM validates it, right? But as you're going through your various areas of the bank, and, and so take a look at your audit schedule or your audit universe. So you've probably got 28 to 40 uh, key audit areas that you evaluate, right? So ERM should be your, so if you're the auditor, your ERM platform should validate where the risk resides and what the frequency of audit should be. And so I'll, again, I'll use some real simple topics, right? If you're a, uh, if you're a, a big SBA lender and, and you're doing a lot of SBA stuff and, and that's driving, say, within your credit risk area, your inherent risk gap, and you think the frequency is more of a, uh, a, a semi-annual kind of frequency to drive your audit practices. I hope this is getting to what you're asking. Um, but when I think of scope, uh, so actually I kind of went to schedule there. Scope is an auditor can look at the ERM report and it should tell you where the greatest risk resides of the bank. So auditors should love an ERM output, right? Because if, if it's accurate and done well, it's gonna tell you where your greatest risk resides and that should help scope your audit perspective, but it should also it should also contribute to your frequency in your your audit schedule itself or in your audit universe. So again, uh, if you look at your ERM dashboard, you should be able to drill down to where some of the greatest inherent risk is, and and looking at current controls, and that should be able to scope your audit. I at least that would to me, and that's something that I think would make a ton of sense to an audit committee. I actually sit on a bank board in the Midwest. And I chair the audit committee, and that's what how I have them use the ERM report. I want to look at, at the macro first of inherent risk, adequacy risk management, and direction, and then I want to drill down within those risk categories to see where the risk, you know, inherent risk is residing for the bank. Now, what's funny is when you measure controls, it, it's the inherent risk to me is is going to give me more information about what I want to audit more so than my control my adequacy risk management but that's important too. So that was probably a long answer to yours, but I would use it in terms of looking at across the enterprise to look at the inherent risk levels by risk areas, the adequacy of controls, and have that tie back into your frequency and, and your scope of response. Uh, let's see, could, hopefully that helps. Could CBR serve a mortgage company rather than a bank? Uh, we do have, the short answer is we do have a mortgage module. So for our bank clients that have mortgage companies, uh, do we have a ERM risk assessment for the, a mortgage bank, if you will, or a mortgage department or a mortgage company? Short answer is yes. It's a standalone tool. And uh, uh, so we can do just, just mortgage. As a matter of fact, on, on a sales pitch side, you know, we talk about, you know, risk appetite, enterprise risk assessment, and top risk analysis. They are all modules. And if you really wanted to, I guess you could break them down from us. But I have had companies buy our strategy solution in our risk appetite module because risk appetite does such a great job of serving strategic planning. So our stuff is modular. Wow. Great questions. I hope I hope that did some help in answering your questions. If they didn't, um, blame Robert or feel free to contact us directly and, and we'll give you some examples. Uh, we actually have a report. So for the, the individual that asked the question about audit scope, we actually have a, a an output that integrates the audit report with the enterprise risk assessment itself. So in other words, it crosswalks the audit universe with the ERM risk assessment and it either validates or challenges the internal audit's view of inherent and composite risk of those risk categories, or those audit areas, I should say. Okay, well, gosh, guys, it is uh, almost high noon somewhere, one o'clock somewhere, 11 o'clock where I am. I hope those answered your questions. Thank you for your attentive uh, participation in this session. Uh, I hope we have a chance to work with you. Uh, the, we're, we're passionate about helping our clients uh, optimize their performance while doing the best job they can on controlling the risk. With that, have a great day, and I hope your uh, uh, what's going on with the coronavirus or the price wars in, in the energy field isn't uh, 
uh, having too much of an adverse effect on your environment. All the best.